Hello, everyone. Did you have a question? Yeah, you seem like I don't care. <laughs> I literally was just like asked to come, and so I'm here. And I'm very excited to be here. Um, uh, my name is Jalen. Um, I'm still on the system as Jacob, though, so that's how you'll probably see me in the computer. Um, I do ultrasound stuff. I know quite a few of you, uh, but not everyone. Um, I uh, did my ultrasound fellowship in 2014-2015, um, and I was in charge of the entire ultrasound program at University of Kentucky before Mike got me a job here uh, a year and a half ago. I'm so happy to be here. This is one of my favorite topics because I really believe that it is the building block for all things ultrasound guided. So if you could be really good at ultrasound guided IVs, which I honestly believe is the hardest procedure that exists in ultrasound. It is the hardest. It can be the easiest, but it's usually the hardest. So if you can get good at ultrasound guided peripheral IV access, which is difficult, very low risk, everything else will be easier. Central lines with ultrasound guidance are a piece of cake, even if you've never done one before, if you've ever cannulated a difficult vein. Think about it, veins are tiny, right? The peripheral ones. Um, the IVs are small. If you're doing a central line, they're this big, and you're using a 14 gauge, right? It's a lot easier to see and a much bigger target. Um, and then for uh, some of the residents in the room, the attendings, um, it also helps with everything else, arthrocentesis, nerve blocks, everything else. And of course, our other uh, um, colleagues besides physicians, uh, depending on what you guys all get into. Um, this is the building block and it's quite important. And it's important to do it right. The first thing with anything that you ever do in medicine is what? It's knowing when to apply a tool, right? I have a jigsaw that I love. I've used it twice. I bought it in med school and I've used it two times and both times it has been the only tool for that specific thing. I don't throw away the jigsaw, but I know when to use it. Most of the time I'm gonna use my big circular saw, right? Same thing with ultrasound guided vascular access. Does this person need an ultrasound to help find a vein? Not really, right? This person is the one that you might have a little bit more difficulty with, right? This is the one that I know that our nurse colleagues especially are so good at landmark based IVs. I have no idea how they do them. I've done now 13 my entire career. I've only done 13 IVs without ultrasound guidance. I've done like thousands with ultrasound guidance. Um, there was one night actually, uh, Will, uh, watched me do five because we were just like slow and I was like doing them all. Um, so I got five in one night, but this is the patient, right? And it might not be this patient who um, has great phenomenal veins that you could probably put a 14 in in the forearm. The problem is, is that there's a little bit of excess, a uh, little extra adipose in between the skin and that vein, so you can't see it, you can't feel it, right? And that's when ultrasound comes in handy. And there's other times uh, where patients, for whatever reason, let's say they're a lupus patient, let's say they're type one diabetic, they don't have great vascular access, or their little peripheral veins are all tiny, sclerosis, very twisty. These are the ones where ultrasound guidance actually does very well. This is a DKA patient that I saw. It was uh, probably my second year of residency. And she came in DKA, a uh, smaller lady, and really had just like exploded veins everywhere. Did not have any veins in her feet, in her calves, have no veins in her forearms. And she'd come and she'd get a central line every single time she'd come to the hospital. And this was her poor neck, right? And you can avoid doing this. You can avoid causing these problems in patients, which central lines you know, they're difficult, right? Um, or they can be, and especially if you're not trained right, and they can cause big complications. And so every time that we're doing this, even if under ultrasound guidance, we're potentially exposing her to risk of fistulas, um, of dissections of that carotid artery, of pneumothoraces even. So we wanna try and avoid these, and we can do that by learning good ultrasound guided vascular access. Now, uh, I know we have a mixed crowd, um, and I don't know how everybody practices, but, there's a, a whole like series of, I could talk for like three hours on the literature as to like why you should be doing this, but this is my like ultra summary. When you're doing central lines in general, ultrasound is better than landmark guidance. This includes subclavian lines. Arterial lines, it's about equivalent. If you can feel a bounding radial pulse, you don't need the ultrasound. So it's the same thing as with peripheral IVs. It's when you have a patient in which they are a difficult um, access or difficult for that R line, that's when ultrasound does well. And then peripheral lines, almost invariably, they're gonna be better uh, than landmark guidance, except in all comers. When you have studies that look at all comers, like everybody who comes into the ER gets an IV, gets randomized to ultrasound or landmark, the landmark's actually better because it's faster, right? Um, but that's a bad patient population. So know how to read the data. Most of the data that is only in difficult IV access patients, invariably ultrasound is gonna have higher success rates, less complication rates. There's three things we're gonna talk about, equipment, preparation, and then actually performing it. 
Let's talk a little bit about equipment here. So this is normal IV stuff, right? We're pretty comfortable with like how to maneuver ourselves through this. When we add the ultrasound to it, we're gonna add a couple of extra things. We're gonna use a long IV catheter. I'm gonna talk about why even if they seem pretty superficial, if I'm gonna spend the time and do this ultrasound guided vascular access, I'm always using a longer catheter. That is uh, typical is like 1.2, 1.12 is a typical IV as far as inches length. Um, at minimum, I do the 1.75. And if the patient is uh, quite deep, I'll do a 2.5 inch catheter. Um, you wanna use a, a tegaderm uh, and non-bottle gel. This is important because you don't wanna use a non-sterile thing to puncture somebody's uh, veins. And some extra gauze and coban, and this is to help with uh, clean up the gel afterwards because the sticker won't stick if it's wet, right? So you wanna make sure to get, um, get rid of that. Now let's talk about this long IV catheter here. These are the different lengths catheters. So up here we have the standard length catheters. They work for most patients, right? We have our 1.75 and then my favorite are the 2.5 inches. And we do have all of these in the emergency department. The 1.75 are, are quite easy to find. The two and a halfs, if anybody happens to be in the ER, um, ask one of us and we'll uh, grab some for you because we have a, like, they're, they're kind of expensive. So we have them in like a different area than like the rest of the IVs. Um, these are the ones I like. And the reason why I like the longer ones is because of this. So this is uh, my drawing. It's quite good, isn't it? It's a very good drawing. Um, so uh, the little tubey thing, that's the vein. And then over here, like imagine that you have this regular length IV and you bring that down, you get blood, you're super stoked and you barely have the little tip of it in that, in that vein and the patient coughs or breathes and it's gonna pop right out, right? And then that's when you have those extravs and CT scan is when you, the vein popped out of that IV. So the way you avoid that is just, you have the same distance from the skin to the vein, you just use a longer catheter and then more of that catheter is in the vein, less likely to come out. It has a little more give when uh, the patient moves or um, they accidentally pull or whatever. Now, with the gel, this is important to use the right stuff. This is basically the three kinds that we can see, right? We have the bottle gel, and then we have two different packets, like a big packet and a small packet. Look at this right here. What does it say? Does it say sterile or does it say non-sterile? So don't use this, especially like those bigger bottles that you see that we don't have a whole lot of uh, anymore. We're using a little more of the packets, the smaller ones, but those are non-sterile. So do not use those for ultrasound guided vascular access because you're at a very high risk for infection. So if you're not sure, just double check. Do you guys see, does it say sterile or non-sterile? It's clearly written on there, right? So just double check. These little packs um, are the ones uh, that I typically use. The uh, bigger one down there or the smaller one that's um, sterile. Make sense? Don't use this one. Okay. Now I will use extra uh, gauze and coban for two reasons. Uh, the extra gauze is to clean off the gel when you're done because you have to use gel um, for the ultrasound beam to actually get into uh, the skin. If there's any air in between the ultrasound uh, probe and the skin, ultrasound machine won't see anything. So you have to use that to help it get in there. The other thing is that I will wrap the whole IV with coban. And the reason for that is because it takes a little bit of time. It's taking me away from patient care. And so I don't want it to come out and have to do it again. So for the most part, um, I am tr I'm very aggressive with how I take these because I don't want them to come out. Multiple reasons, right? I mean, the patient, by the time they get uh, the request, they've already been stabbed like five or six times, right? Um, I don't want it to be an eighth time, right? Assuming that I get it the seventh time. And the other thing is that it just, it takes time away, right? And we don't want it to come out like in the CT scan or whatever. All right, so we wanna gather our equipment. That was the first step where we talked about that. Ultrasound machine, obviously, is the, the one extra thing. Now, this is my next step, actually, is I will put up the tourniquet first. And I put it all the way up here, just basically underneath the deltoid. Now, the reason I do it all the way up here is because starting out, I don't know where I'm gonna go. I don't know if I'm gonna go in the forearm. I don't know if I'm gonna go up here. I have no idea. And it saves a step. I used to look first then put everything down, then clean, then put the tourniquet up. And I found that I couldn't see veins all the time so I didn't have that tourniquet up, number one. And number two, um, I'd have to basically clean the arm twice. I basically had to put the gel in the non-sterile gel, do it, clean it off, then clean, and then put more ultrasound gel in there. It didn't make sense. So I just skipped that step altogether, put the tourniquet up. And then the reason I put it up here is because um, uh, I don't know which vein I'm going for. Now, a uh, question. Um, do you guys know, uh, maybe some of the residents know, maybe some of our other colleagues know as well, uh, what is, if you look at the trauma guidelines, how long can an arterial tourniquet stay up before they recommend that you take it down? An arterial tourniquet. Yes, Ellie. Have they been for two hours? Yes. So do you think your patient can tolerate five minutes with a stretchy tourniquet that just 
occludes a little bit of the venous flow? Very likely, right? I know when I start out uh, with someone who's not done the ultrasound guided vascular access, the fact that I leave the tourniquet on for an extra couple of minutes might make some people a little uncomfortable because it's not how many of us were trained. But if you really think about the literature behind it, it is exceedingly unlikely to cause harm to the patient if they have that tourniquet up for one to two more minutes, which if you put it up first, that's the maximum amount of time extra that that patient will have that tourniquet on. Then, basically from the tourniquet all the way down to the forearm, I will clean the entire arm, making sure to get the medial aspect and the lateral aspect because there's different veins in different areas, which we'll talk about. Any questions so far? I talk kind of fast, just how I am. I promise I'm not like uh, uh, that nervous. Then uh, we're gonna look for a vein, which I'll talk about, and then we cannulate the vein. So those are all the steps, right? So this is uh, just a quick example of putting on that tourniquet. So I'll put it all the way up here, and I usually put it fairly tight, and I almost invariably will apologize to the patient patient by saying, I'm going to put this tight. I'm so sorry. It's just, this makes the veins bigger. And I really only want to poke you one time, which when I word it that way, patients seem to have an okay time with it. And then I clean the entire arm from top to bottom. Now with the transducer itself, has anybody grabbed the ultrasound machine and found blood on the probes? Mike and I hate that. It's so annoying and it's so inconvenient and so irresponsible, but it happens. And I'll be honest, sometimes I'm in the middle of a procedure, it's a code and I'm not paying attention. And then another patient comes in. So I've, I've, I've uh, had this. Oh, hello. How are you? Um, you're just in time. We're talking about the important part right here. I was waiting. Um, so make sure before you take the machine into the room, make sure that there's no blood on the machine anywhere. And I look at the other probes and also look down at the base because sometimes when you put in these uh, big 18s, um, sometimes it's very like spurty. So, and sometimes people don't clean the machine. So make sure there's no, no blood on them. And what I typically do is as I'm rolling into the room, I will get a, uh, a gray wipe, clean the transducer and leave the gray wipe on the transducer as I'm bringing it in because the uh, gray wipes and the purple wipes, they're actually intermediate level disinfection. So low level is like alcohol swabs and soap and water. Intermediate is uh, purple wipes and gray wipes. And then uh, uh, higher level cleaning is like sending it to another department to get cleaned. So it's pretty good cleaning and it's good for human tissues basically. So I'll leave it on there. And the reason I leave it on there is that technically the gray wipes to have full like sterility need a dwell time of three minutes before it's actually clean. Okay, um, so I'll do that first. Now, if you want an extra layer of uh, protection for your patient, let's say they're immunocompromised, you really wanna make sure that there's no contamination. This is what I do. I put a little uh, layer of gel um, on that transducer, just a small layer right here. Notice this is the non-sterile uh, gel. And then what I'll do is I'll grab like a bigger tegaderm, um, not one of the tiny ones, not the ones with the ridges, and I'll put it over top of that to just create like a little extra layer of protection. It also helps a bit with cleanup um, because if I happen to get a little blood on the transducer, I just take that off and the blood comes with it. The one thing I will mention is that if you have any bubbles or like wrinkles on that tegaderm on the anterior surface, don't rub it with your non-sterile finger because you've just defeated the purpose of the, uh, the tegaderm, right? All right, now let's talk about the veins. Now in the form, there are so many veins, so many variabilities, I'm not even gonna talk about them. What I'm gonna talk about is the three main veins in the upper arm. Now I'm gonna focus on here because these are like standard. They're always there. Almost invariably they're gonna be there, but I always look first in the forearm because you'd be surprised. Sometimes there's great veins in the forearm and why wouldn't you go for those, right? You should go for the more distal ones. This is especially true in our patients that have a little bit extra um, adiposity. Um, those patients are the ones that you can put a 14 in a forearm vein um, because they have to perfuse all that extra adipose tissue um, and then you can't see, you can't feel it. So especially in the, um, the fluffier patient, I will actually look in the forearm like quite diligently because almost always there's something there. Now, in the upper arm, there are three main veins. We have the brachial, the basilic, and the cephalic. Now, does this person need an ultrasound guided IV? No, he doesn't. Um, this is a, uh, one of my, uh, it was my first ultrasound fellow. Um, and I was just like one time on trip, like, hey, I'm gonna record your arm, stay still. So this are, these are the three different bundles. So the first one I'm gonna talk about here is the brachial veins. Um, there's two brachial veins and one artery. Um, and then there's this little guy down here. So, I can't really tell right off the bat exactly which one is the artery, which one's the vein. And that's something that we're gonna discuss. But the other one that I wanna talk about is this little structure right here. It's a honeycomb structure. It's a nerve. 
You really have to pay attention if you are going for the brachial veins to know exactly where that median nerve is because that will hurt. Sometimes the nerve is directly above one of the veins and that's why it's important. In this case, it's off to the side so it doesn't really matter, but make sure that you identify any of the nerves. It's a honeycomb structure that stays along with the, uh, the vascular bundle um, and don't go through that. The patient will let you know, obviously, like they'll, they'll jump because it hurts. They'll let you know if, if you've poked it, but you know, try to avoid it. All right, so those are the first ones we usually talk about. Look at this one, right? This is like almost a full centimeter in diameter, right? Like this is a centimeter marker right here. Huge vein. This is the basilic vein. Now, when you are learning, when you are starting out, and I mean like less than 15 to 20 under your belt, successful cannulations, probably start with this one, the basilic vein. It's usually quite straight. If you have uh, an IV drug user, let's say, most of the time they haven't found that vein for whatever reason. Um, and there's really no, uh, there's no artery there for sure. And there's really no big nerves in that area either. So this is a great one to start with. However, once you get good and once you get a little more comfortable with it, I would actually avoid this vein. Does anybody have an idea why you should avoid this once you get a little bit better? <laughs> right, because I like to save these for pick lines. Because, you know, if you cannulate a vein too many times, it stops working, right? Um, the next one, which is my favorite vein to cannulate, is this little guy out here. Now, um, everybody's got, like, some differences in their venous anatomy. But if you just look lateral to the bicep, and many patients, they have a cephalic vein. Cephalic vein, there's nothing next to it. No one ever is going to put a pick line in that. And it's... The other thing with the uh, basilic is that it can kind of rub and be a little irritating for the patient. If you put it out here, the patient's not even going to like know it's there. So that is my favorite vein. Unfortunately, it's usually the vein that's the smallest. Kind of stinks. Sometimes you get lucky. I always look for the cephalic. If the cephalic's there, I'm going to go for it. Now, for choosing your best vein, right? Because you, you have a lot of options, right? You might have five different areas that you can cannulate a vein. How do you know which one's the best one? The first one is depth. You want one, a vein that is uh, between 0.5 and 1.5 centimeters in depth from the skin surface. Now, why don't I say zero to 1.5? Out of curiosity. Exactly. You should be able to palpate it, right? And the issue is, is that now if we look back at, let's say, uh, this screen right here, this is like, okay, like I, uh, I have a distance here. Like if I, I'm off the center a little bit, like maybe I can redirect. This is nothing. As soon as you poke the tip of that catheter in the vein, if you angled it too sharp or you're off to the side, let's say you're off to this side, uh, this side over here, if you just get the sharp, the stabby part under the skin, you've already shredded the lateral wall. You've already messed up. There's no way to redirect. So that's why I actually don't go for the most superficial veins specifically for that reason. Plus, if they're superficial, you should be able to cannulate them without the ultrasound, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is large, right? You wanna go for the biggest vein possible, especially if you're starting out. But once you get like 50, 60, 70 under your belt, then I would start playing around with not going for the largest one, but going for one that you can safely place a 20 or an 18 gauge uh, through. So you can save those larger ones for the next time they come. Because I feel like, I don't have literature to support this necessarily, but if somebody comes in for different, and they have difficult vascular access today, what's the odds at the next visit they're also gonna need ultrasound guided IV? It's pretty high, right? Um, so once you get better, I try to get the, the trickier ones. But for now, go for the largest one. So this right here, this is one centimeter. You see the death mark right here? This is an ideal length. Because if I'm a little off center when I initially do my cannulation, I can actually just readjust and eventually get it right into the center of that lumen. So this is like perfect for me. Now, after you've identified a good depth and it's the large one, you want to avoid any landmines. So things that you want to not go through to get to that vein. Um, do you guys recognize the landmine here? Right there. So that's the median nerve. And in this situation, the median nerve is actually lying right on top of those vessels. One of these is the artery, and there's two that are the vein. But this is one you have to be very careful. I'm not saying you can't cannulate it, but you have to be careful with it. You could actually, let's say this is the vein, which it might be. You can actually just come from the side here and attach it that, attack it that way. Um, but just be cognizant of that. And also, you don't want to go through any of the arteries. Now, speaking of which, how can you tell what an artery is and what a vein is? Half, and if it's pulsatile. So the, the collapsing thing does work, but caveat to that, you're correct. But the caveat is you have to hold pressure, right? You hold pressure because especially if you have a hypotensive patient, the vein and the artery will both collapse. 
right? Especially if you're a little hard on your push and it's like kind of muscular or bony underneath so they have a good like back pressure. If you just do this, the vein and the artery will both compress. Um, so compressibility, yes, but the, the main thing is pulsatility that I look for. Now there is extra stuff. All machines have this, this is color Doppler. Color Doppler can be helpful, right? You see how one's pulsatile and one's not pulsatile? Or I guess one's more pulsatile, right? Because the veins actually have pulsatility to them as well, but it's not like pulse pulsatile. You can do pulse wave Doppler if you want to. This is like ridiculous to go this far, but this is a venous flow. This is arterial spikes. But really the main thing is this, compressibility versus pulsatility. Now here's an example. One of these is an artery and one of these is the vein and I'm gonna compress. They both do, right? Now, what ha same, th same thing. And you see how I'm holding pressure. They both collapse, but one of them starts to pulsate and the other one doesn't. Don't go for the pulsatile one. <laughs> Unless you're art lining. If you're art lining, it's great. The other thing is non-curving. This can be a little tricky to identify. And these are, for me, they're the most fun to cannulate. I actually love cannulating these curvy ones because you have to like chase it. Um, but they are difficult if you don't have uh, a few under your belt. And this is what I'm talking about right here. So this is a patient's forearm vein right here. It's like a, one of those guns, like the Gatling guns. Just, just a lot of swirliness and those can be kind of difficult. So when you're starting out, I would try to avoid these. And then the last thing is ideal location. This is really just about thinking about the patient and how a vein would affect them, right? So here's an arm, the same arm. And this is how I kind of have it labeled right here. So green is the best areas to cannulate. Yellow is go for it, but if you have something better, go for that other one. And then right in the anticube is a very bad idea to get to actually on with ultrasound. And the reason is, is that you're bringing your IV I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you're bringing your IV at this much of an angle, let's say, right? Now that IV catheter is gonna have to scoop, like do a U all the way back up to the arm. It almost invariably, you're just poking through that back wall, right? So I avoid the anticube itself. There have been times where I've done the anticube because that's all that's there. Um, sometimes in kids, it's the only ones I can see, like babies. And sometimes the only one I can see in like agitated patients that are flailing around. And my little trick that I do, if I have to put it in the anti-cube, is I actually put a SAM splint behind their uh, elbow so they can't bend their arm, at least while they have that IV in. Usually that's in the short term while I'm resuscitating them, and then I'll put another IV somewhere else. All right, you got your patient prepped, you got your veins selected. Now, your time, now it's time for the fun part, which is actually doing the procedure itself. So this is one of the probes that we have. We have butterfly transducers here. We've got a few other ones. But this right here, see this dot? This is quite important. This dot always is gonna match up with a dot that you see on the ultrasound screen. So that's how you know which way is left and which way is right. The dot on the probe and the dot on the screen will always match up and that helps you orient left and right. This right here, you guys see the dot right here? Right there? And then there's a dot on this side. So what you see how as I'm moving left, it moves the image, all the image moves over that way. Um, that's what you wanna see, right? And you wanna see that because as you do your initial cannulation, let's say right here, you see how I'm moving the needle tip and it's moving the same direction on the ultrasound machine? That's how you tell which way is left, which way is right. Always make sure that that matches up with your screen. Now let's talk about how to line up your vein, right? Because you don't want to, let's say that the vein's like this, you don't want to cannulate the vein this way. You want to cannulate the vein straight on, right? <coughs> So this is how you identify what the path of that vein is. And you identify it by finding out when your probe is going to be perpendicular to that vein. Okay. So here's a vein. It's a little curvy, right? It's not perfectly straight. Here's our transducer. Do you guys see the uh, probe marker? And then the probe marker? Okay. So those are the probe markers. Now, this is an ultrasound screen right here. And remember the ultrasound, if you put it here in the uh, short, uh, short axis relative to the vein, so this is like, you know, normally they're rectangular. Um, you're seeing a cross section of the vein, okay? It's almost like you're slicing the vein right here and then you're like looking at it from this way, okay? It's just a transverse cut through that vein. Now, as I go up and down the arm, do you see how it's moving left to right? And it's because my vein, according to the transducer, my vein is moving left to right because I'm not perfectly perpendicular to that vein. So what you do is as you're moving up and down the arm, you slowly rotate that transducer until you find the axis in which you are per, uh, perfectly perpendicular to that vein. And then it stays as just a center circle as you move up and down. That's how you know that you're lined up well. And then your vein, your uh, catheter is gonna go um, perpendicular to that uh, transducer, which makes it parallel to that vein. That's how you line yourself up. And we'll practice. 
Uh, here's an example. Um, this is actually kind of fun. This is my, uh, my wife's arm, and I like tracked her vein, and I'd like put dots here, 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 then I drew a line. That's, that green thing is her vein, okay? So here's an example on a real human. Everything's lined up well. You guys see that little tiny forearm vein right there? Now see how it's moving left to right on the screen? It's not centered, okay? We're not perpendicular to its path. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to now uh, rotate that transducer, just turn it just a little bit, and try to get on exactly the right plane, exactly perpendicular to that vein. So I'm still figuring it out, and then right here, you see how now it's staying in one spot? Staying in one spot now. So now my probe is perpendicular to that vein. Cool beans? Any questions on that? I want the vein to be in the center of the image, right? It makes it, it makes it the easiest, yeah, yeah right. Your probe marker would be... Right. Yeah, because there's a probe marker right in the middle of the like, long part as well. Exactly right, yeah. All right, so we have a long axis and a short axis. I'm actually, I'm going to just skip through this actually because we're just going to do long, uh, short axis today. That's all we're going to talk about. Long axis is a little harder. We're just going to skip this. All right. Now, this right here, this is the most important thing. You always have to know exactly where that needle tip is. If you lose that needle tip, you gotta find it with the ultrasound machine because you, that's when you potentially could go through, hit a artery, hit a nerve, or hit some other structure that's important, right? Always gotta know where that needle tip is. Now, I'll see this sometimes in textbooks. I'll see them use like the Pythagorean theorem where it's like the vein's one inch down. Let's like, let's measure one inch back. Let's keep the probe steady. And if I go at the 45 degree angle, I'm like, I'm gonna like get into it, right? How, how accurate do you think we are at like this? Right, like, and what if the vein is like 1.25 centimeters deep? Like, are you gonna like measure back 1.25 centimeters and then have a little protractor, like a tiny protractor and like measure exactly for it? Like, you're not gonna do that, okay? And remember the previous slide, I said the most important thing is to always know where your needle tip is. So please do not do this. This is a very poor form. People do this, but you shouldn't. Now, what you can do is you can estimate, right? So that, I mean, this is, this is an example, right? 50 degrees, boom. You go through and you're just gonna stab all the way through. And then all of a sudden that's when you see your first little dot on the ultrasound. And then if you're a little too uh, sharp, right? A little too acute with your angle, you'll never see it move because the ultrasound beam, it only tells you what it sees along that path. So it doesn't know the difference between this being the tip or being the shaft. It has no idea what the difference is. You have to figure out what the difference is, right? So this is why that technique doesn't work. Now, what does work is you can do that, you can estimate. I think it's about an inch down, or I think it's a, and I think to get it about a 45 degree angle, I'm gonna go about an inch back. You can eyeball it, just bring your transducer back to the transducer, to where the actual needle is puncturing the skin. Puncture the skin, and as soon as you see that little hypocoic dot, or hypercoic dot, excuse me, then you stop, then you move the transducer till that dot disappears, and so on, and so forth, and so on, and so forth, and you're basically like guiding the tip of that catheter into that vein. There's a bunch of different ways that people describe it. I like to call it sequential needle tip tracking. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it describes well what you're doing. You're sequentially tracking the needle tip. You're not moving the transducer and the needle at the same time. You're doing one first, then the other. And here's what it looks like in real life. Well, I guess it's not in real life with a, with a little phantom here. So you guys see that hypercoic dot right there? And see, I'm moving one, then the other, one, then the other, until I get it right into the center of that vein. So this is the way that I suggest doing all of your ultrasound guided vascular axis if you're using the short axis. Here's an example on an actual patient. Now this one's interesting. You can see the bruising already from previous IV attempts. There's even a little hematoma right here. Um, and I have the uh, catheter, um, the tourniquet up uh, a bit high, like I usually do. And look at the trajectory of this one. You see, I'm going back and forth to find uh, exactly the path of that vein. And I'm quite oblique with this vein specifically. Now I'll do my initial stick and you'll see that hypercoic point up there. And notice I'm moving the needle, then the transducer, needle, then the transducer, until I find it in the center of that lumen. Right there. And then one extra thing that you can do is you can do this, which is then turn it into the long axis to make sure that you're not gonna poke through that back wall. This is an extra thing. If we have time to go through it today on the stations, we will. Um, it's something that I do, especially if I'm scared of poking through that back wall. Now, for our, especially our uh, peripheral IV landmark-based guidance experts, 
this is what I get asked a lot. And I even get told when I'm, when I'm doing a, a stressful ultrasound guide at IV, let's say it's a, it's a sick patient, I'm putting one in, um, I often, somebody will tell me, like somebody behind me will be like, hey, there's a flash. Um, I never look for a flash because it's a hint of what's going on. And why would you use the hint of what's going on when you can literally see everything on the ultrasound screen, right? It can actually mislead you because you might, let's say you might have punctured um, th completely through that wall. You see that flash, you just try to thread that catheter and you completely blow that vein, right? Um, uh, alternatively, let's say that you barely got one part of the bevel. You know how the bevel is like a triangle? Let's say you barely got this part of the bevel in the vein and you have a little bit of blood go back, you try to advance it. The catheter itself is not actually in the lumen yet, right? So you're not gonna be able to advance that catheter. So I do not look down until I have already started threading that catheter. That's when I might look down because then I have to see when I can pull the, uh, the needle out, right? Once I've like hubbed the, uh, the IV catheter. Flash is just a hint. The truth is what you see on the ultrasound machine. So you don't need to look down until you're threading that catheter. Cool? All right, let's talk about a couple of tips to maximize your success. The first one is mapping out your path. Now let's say you have a vein that there is like this much of that vein is like, that's all, the only place you can cannulate. And if you can get that, then the patient's gonna have this great IV, right? You just plan it out. Just, you come back a few, you decide, hey, I'm gonna cannulate back here. It's my vein actually comes into the picture at this point. So I'm gonna do my cannulation initially with the, uh, the tip of the IV completely away from that vein because I know where I wanna cannulate is right there and that's where my path is. So you gotta kind of map it out. Think about where the placement is on there. On the arm, brace both of your hands when you're doing an IV, right? It's all about ergonomics. I, uh, sometimes I see new learners, they have the rail up, they're hunched over like this, trying to do this, their arms are like hanging like, like up here in the air and they'll, sh they're shaking because like it's, it gets stressful and you, you're, you know, you get tired. I have everything braced. So I'll have the, my hand, my uh, stabby hand. So it's that your dominant hand is your stabby hand. That's where the IV goes. So I'll have the stabby hand actually on the table, usually with my elbow up like this, or I'll have it on the patient's arm. It's closed, right? Yeah. Or I'll have it on the patient's arm kind of like this, and then I'm guiding it this way. And then my other hand, I either have it on my knee if I don't have a place for the bed, or I'll put it on the bed. So everything is braced because you have so much more dexterity when you don't have to use all of these muscles and you're just using your really dexterous finger muscles. And then of course we already talked about this, right? Using that longer catheter. Now I will say that if you can see a vein and like, because sometimes I get called, we're part of the vascular access team and um, you know, three nurses have tried um, and the patient, for whatever reason, they can't see a vein and sometimes I'll see a vein and it's, it's 0.1 centimeters from the skin surface. It's quite superficial. On that patient, I might use a regular standard length catheter, but for the most part, I'm always gonna use that long one. And this, the most important thing, do not lose sight of that needle tip. If you lose sight of the needle tip, um, there's a couple of things that I do. The first one is um, I will do a little bounce back and forth, up and down. Because sometimes that'll help you see, oh, this little hyperechoic speck that I thought was just like a fiber of muscle is actually the IV. Um, don't do this or this, you wanna just bounce it back and forth along the path you've already gone through because let's say you're right next to an artery, you don't see the needle tip and if you do that, you might cut open the artery, you don't wanna do that, right? So um, you go up, bounce back and forth and the other thing is that let's say that you have your uh, transducer like this, you have your uh, IV like this. Now the best reflection you'll get, just like a mirror, right, is directly in front of it. So, so uh, um, it's about 45 degrees, no, 90 degrees. 90 degree angle, right? That's the best thing. So um, you have the transducer. If you have the, the IV like this, you see how this is not at a, it's not a 90 degree angle. So this will actually get like pushed off and then some of them will make it back. So it's not always so bright. So what you can do is you can actually turn the transducer just this way, just a little bit um, on the skin. So it kind of looks like, um, like here's the, the transducer like this and I have uh, the IV in here like this. So I'll actually turn the transducer this way. So it actually creates a 90 degree angle with the, uh, the needle. And then as I'm doing my needle tip tracking, I'll actually just keep it like this as I go down. So that also can help a lot with finding that needle tip. After, After insertion, yeah. And honestly, like what I do sometimes is that you, you bring a great point, Kyle. So let's say like this is, you know, this is the, uh, the, the skin right here. Here's needle, here's the, uh, the ultrasound. Um, often what I'll do is I'll come super sharp, get the stabby part in and then bend it 
go a little bit further and then I'll bring the ultrasound machine to it. Because sometimes, especially if you're using the butterflies where it's kind of like a little bulky, sometimes it's a little difficult to like know exactly where your needle tip is until it's actually gone uh, like, what, 0.5 centimeters through the skin because the, um, the big bulky ultrasound transducer, it's right in the middle is where that beam is. So you have to like get to the middle of that transducer. So sometimes I'll poke, then bring the transducer up to it. Good point. Now, this is a stat I wanna leave you with. This is my success rate when I started. My 11th ultrasound guided IV was my first successful cannulation. This is hard and it's okay to fail. There's like nothing that any of you have ever done that you've gotten 100% good the first time in your life, right? Um, how many of us have seen babies walk like a tiny baby? Okay, great. Are they good at it? They're really bad at walking, like really bad at walking. Like they fall on their face all the time. It's a good thing that they're so low to the ground um, and they're so squishy, um, but they're really bad at it, right? And then I think about other things. Like the first time I looked at an EKG, it was very intimidating. And the 50th time I looked at an EKG, it was very intimidating. But after seeing thousands of EKGs, I'm like, that's not a STEMI. It's good, right? You figure it out. And think about all the other things that you do in medicine that you were first training. It was difficult and intimidating and scary. And now you do it and you're like, you could do it while having a full conversation with somebody else about another thing, right? Because it's, it's, you get used to it. It's just all about muscle memory. And just think about your, I don't know, hopefully everybody has a parent that they like, uh, but think about one of your parents or relative, a loved one that comes in, into the ER. Would you like the nursing staff and the hospital staff where you're at to know how to do this and know how to do it well? Or would you want them to have quit three in if they didn't get it? So that's how I think about it, right? And this will save time. Um, it will improve uh, patient satisfaction and improve throughput. It's everything is good. It's a little hard. The only way to get better is to practice. Does anybody have any questions? Quick plugs. This website is pretty sweet. So if you want to get into some ultrasound education, um, this is the POCUS Atlas. It has a bunch of images on there, uh, lots of video narrations as well, a lot of learning resources called The POCUS Atlas, The POCUS Atlas. And this is Mike Macias' site. And then I have one as well. I have a YouTube as well um, called Core Ultrasound um, where we have a bunch of like education-y things there. Um, and I also have um, all stuff, uh, but I also have like basically the important parts of this lecture that I just gave um, are on there as well on the peripheral vascular access stuff. There's art line stuff in there, central line stuff in there as well. All right. I guess we'll scan now. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle.